We're going to begin again. This time we're going to drill in and actually talk about some of the science that the LSST is going to be able to do. And joining us to talk about that is Dr. Michael Homer, who is not a bald man from Arizona, but a German man from Arizona. And he's going to give this talk in German. Alright, so my name is Michael Mollard, I did my PhD in Germany, I grew up in Germany. And I moved to Arizona to work, like, work with Professor Balgai for a couple of years. And now I'm low observatory in the Kingdom Flag Cemetery. Uh, it's actually where Pluto was discovered. So it's. it's Alright, so, right, so I would like to talk about something. Um, an example that shows you that things are sometimes more complicated than you might think. Or Okay, so I'm going to talk about asteroids and comets. So, on the left, you have a picture of a random asteroid, on the right, you have a picture of a comet ISON. What's the difference between the two? Closer. Closer. What's the difference? So, comets have a tail, and they have a coma. So, they are those beautiful things you see in the sky every once in a while, beautiful display, and Asteroids are actually just point sources because they're too small and they're too far away to resolve them. So you don't see anything, you don't see the shape, you don't see the surface of the asteroid, they're just too small and too far away. Um, comets have this activity, they're active, and this activity is due to uh, ice sublimating on the surface, so ice is turned into a gas, and that gas drags dust with it. And that's why they show this nice activity. Asteroids are inactive, they're just rocky bodies, there's not a lot of ice on these objects. If you look a little bit closer at those two objects, um, here two different examples. This is near an asteroid Yukawa, which was um, visited by the Japanese Hayabusa spacecraft a while ago. This is Comet 67P Choyu of Gerasimenko, visited by the Rosetta spacecraft. And especially because so you don't really see jets coming off the surface here. So that's a major difference between the two. They look kind of similar. They have rocky surfaces, they have boulders on the surface. The, sky, the size scale in this case is a little bit different. This is um, 150 meters or so from here to there, and this guy is a kilometer or something like that. Two kilometers, right? Here's, here's an actual comet expert. Okay, so they, they look kind of similar. But the big difference is, of course, comets are active, asteroids are not active. There are other dif differences between asteroids and comets. So here we have top view on the solar system. Uh, this is the sun with the yellow dot. If you look uh, on the solar system from the top, you see that asteroids, they have kind of circular orbits. We call this, they have low eccentricity. That's the, the orbital parameter that defines the elongation of an orbit. Um, and also, all those asteroid orbits are in one plane, which we call the ecliptic. This is where the planets move, and most asteroids move in the same plane. Comets are different. They have very elongated orbits, they have high eccentricities. So, many comets, they go all the way out to the outer solar system, and then they come back to the sun. So, that's a big difference in the asteroids, and another difference is that the inclinations in comets are a lot higher too. So, you can, inclination means the angle between the orbit of the comet or the object and the ecliptic plane. So again, asteroids are all in the ecliptic plane, comets have high inclinations. Alright, asteroids and comets are two different things. That's it, thank you very much, goodbye. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Alright, there, there's a little bit more to it. So if you look at the dynamics again, um, this is an equation, it's a little bit complicated. Just ignore it. Um, so this equation defines the tesserin parameter with respect to Jupiter. So it's just an equation. You put in the orbital elements of your asteroid, the semi-major axis, which is the average distance of your object to the sun, and the eccentricity and the inclination of your object you're looking at, and the semi-major axis of Jupiter. And what you get out of this is just a number. And this is a plot of this number, the tesserin parameter, and the aphelion distance. So the aphelion distance is the longest distance, the widest distance your object can have from the sun. So, so far, how far away 
This is Gaffer on sound. Dr. Redfern. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so what we see here, lots of asteroids, and they have this weird distribution in a helium, and ground through space. Look at the uh, comets, they show up in a different place. So, all the comets are up here. Asteroids are mostly down here. So, again, there are two different things. Comets usually have a two parameter less than three, asteroids have a two certain parameter greater than three. That's it. All right, now things get complicated. So, a while ago, people started discovering asteroids, optics that were previously uh, discovered as asteroids, with Tiny little fuzz balls around them. Like here, a little tail pointing away from the sun. This guy has a pretty nice long tail. This guy is actually breaking up into smaller pieces. There's some fuzziness around that too. Uh, that's a weird imaging from a, um, a spacecraft that actually observes the sun. Again, some fuzziness. Fuzzy, fuzzy. There's a tail. I have more stuff here. All right. White hair. Those are just comets, right? Well, not really. So we'll go back to this plot here. We go back to this plot here. You're really different, right? Uh, okay, and we plot those objects that I just showed to you. You see that they actually show up in the asteroid space, not in the comet space. If they were up here, they're just comets. But they're actually down here, so they're asteroids. Dynamically, they're asteroids, but they look like comets. So what's going on? Are they asteroids or are they comets? So actually, they are most likely of asteroid origin. They are asteroids, but they show activity for some reasons. And it took people a while to figure out why, why is that? What are those mechanisms that drive the activity in those um, objects? So in the case of Sheila in 2010, A2, um, people, well, they looked into different reasons that might trigger that activity and they found that impact on most likely here. A good case is 2010A. It's really hard for, to see for your. If you Google this guy, you find nice images. Um, the head of this structure here, this tail, uh, is actually formed like a cross. And what happened is that two asteroids collided. So you have a collision of two asteroids that form this cross like structure, and you have the tail um, pointing away from the. Um, uh, they're direct on the sun because the, the um, solar radiation pressure is pushing the, the dust away from the impact side. There are other mechanisms. So spin-up is uh, another thing that triggers activity. So this guy here, uh, it's kind of a shame that you can't see it. It actually has five tails. One going this way, this way, this way, this way, and one going. And the, you can actually model that if you have an object that rotates fast enough, you can have surface or boulders on the surface of this object getting ejected into space. So you spin fast enough and the things go pop and they go by, they're gone. And they follow this, um, these trends, uh, tail story. And you can actually model the, um, those are observations with the Hubble Space Telescope. You can model that the, uh, the tails, they change. Uh, as a function of time, and uh, you can explain uh, what they observe with the telescope. This is another example. This is actually a binary asteroid um, that shows activity. And this guy here, too, it uh, actually disrupted. So it just blew up into smaller parts, and they all drift apart. And um, the activity that you see around is actually dust that is left over from this um, disruption. Sublimation is where we see in comets, you have ISIS, they sublimate, that uh, triggers or leads to activity, a coma in the tail. Um, so this is actually the most important thing. And uh, this guy, this is pretty special. Um, what's going on here, Phaethon gets really close to the sun. Like a tenth of the distance that the Earth has to the sun. So that is pretty close for an asteroid. And what happens is that most likely you have the surface tracking from the heat of the sun, and then stuff gets ejected and it forms this tiny little tail. And you only see this activity in this case when the optic is really, really close to the sun. All right, we have active asteroids, and they're, uh, they're asteroids, but they show activity every once in a while. So we can go this way. We can 
we can go from asteroid to comet, or comet-like um, appearance. So what? Why is that interesting? Well, active asteroids are extreme objects. They have properties that are really extreme because they spin fast, they get close to the sun, they have a lot of ices on their surface that cause uh, sublimation, stuff like that. So if we understand those active asteroids, we can better understand the average asteroid. So we can learn a lot about the mechanisms that are going on in asteroids from those active asteroids. Can you go the other way? Did you have a comet? Did it look like an asteroid? Is this a thing? Yes, it is. Well, let's go back to this plot here. Uh, again, we have the comets up here, we have asteroids here, the red dots are the, um, the active asteroids. All the comets are up here. If we subtract the comets, you see there's a tiny little tail from the asteroid clouds that pop and sticks into here. If the sun would be, or the sky wouldn't be so bright, you could see tiny little speckles up here. So there are tiny little dots up here, asteroids in the dynamic space where usually you have comets. Asteroids and comet-like orbits. So one object that was discovered 35 years ago is asteroid Don Quixote. Um, it is located here on this plot, you can't really see it. Um, Don Quixote was discovered and people immediately realized that it has the orbit of a comet. They looked at it with big telescopes, they couldn't see any activity in this object. So it's an asteroid, but it moves on a comet-like orbit. And they were kind of puzzled because they couldn't explain, well, it looks like a comet dynamically, but it doesn't show any activity. What is going on? During my PhD thesis, I worked a lot on Don Quixote. We used the Swiss Space Telescope to look at this object, and we actually found some activity in the infrared, but we never found activity in the optical until a couple of weeks ago. So ever since, for the last five years or so, I've been looking at this object every once in a while. And now we found activity in the optic. So you have the optic here, and then there's a coma, and the tail uh, pointing away from the sun. That's really cool. But it took me only five years. <laughs> okay, so, Don Quixote is not only a dead comet, sometimes people call them dead comet, or inactive comet, it's a dormant comet. It sleeps most of the time if it gets close to the sun. It can still show activity, which tells us that there is still ices, uh, there are ices or volatiles in this object that can sublimate it with, if it gets hot enough. Because right now, the dump field is really close to the sun. Okay, so we can go this way, active asteroids. We can go that way, dormant comets. Again, so what? So, it is not clear what happens to comets when they get old. Either they disrupt, if you remember comet Ison, they got really close to the sun, and it disrupted, it just, it didn't come back. It just disappeared. So this is one possible fate, and another possible fate might be that they just turn inactive, or dormant, and they might activate every once in a while. So this is a potential fate for comets, and it tells us in the case of Don Quixote, because it still activates every once in a while, that they can still harbor ices. So there might be ices in the subsurface, in the, the depth of this, this object. So Don Quixote has a diameter of 19, 19 kilometers, which is a pretty big rock. And you just have to go like 10 or 20 meters into the surface, and you can have water ice in there. And of course, this has implications for the origin of water on Earth. We still don't really know where the water we have on this planet comes from. So, Thorin comics uh, might be one of the sources for this water. Alright, this is my final message, what I want you to take home. So, there is something some people call the asteroid comet continuum. So, there are asteroids, there are comets, and there are some objects that are in between that have an appearance, sometimes like a comet, sometimes it's an asteroid. So it can go back and forth. It's it's not a clear distinction as people thought like a couple years ago. It's not as easy. Alright, since we're talking about LSST, how can LSST help them? So I am observing what sorry, uh, right now about twenty active asteroids are known in one dormant comet that shows activity here. I am monitoring 150 dormant comets. 30 nights per year. I calculated that this number for this talk and it shocked me that I spent 30 nights a year on a telescope. 
So if there's LSST, you can do it for me. I'm about to do it. I guess it well, drives those objects anyway, because they move all across the sky, and it'll eventually pick up my target, observe them, and I can take the data from the LCT database, which is a cool thing. It's taking a lot of work. Okay, and by doing that, LCT will improve our understanding of the small body populations, asteroids, comets, active asteroids, everything that is out there. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. What's the most uh, exotic material we detected in asteroid or comets? What is the most exotic material detected in an asteroid or comet? It's not kryptonite. Uh, I don't know. There's not really a lot of exotic stuff out there. So there's alcohol that was discovered in the comet. comet. That's pretty exotic. Um, other than that, there's some reddish green stuff we call, uh, what is it? Oh, 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 oh. So you, you have, what is it, methane that is exposed to um, uh, high energy radiation in space and then turns into some reddish green stuff. That's why our solar system objects are often reddish in color. What do you say? You know, it's kind of sticky, or I just imagine it's green. Yes. 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 Um, Don Quixote and most of those asteroids that, uh, sorry, those, most of those comets that can hide as asteroids in the asteroid population, they are short period comets. So you have long period comets that basically come from the upper solar system, they go around the sun and they disappear again. Short period comets, they come back every 20 years, less than 20 years disappear. And all those comets are bound to Jupiter, gravitationally. So Jupiter catches them on their way in, and then their orbits are basically um, governed by, by Jupiter. So that's why we're using the parameter with respect to Jupiter, but you can also calculate it for Neptune or some other planets. Yes? Okay, you were talking about retrograde asteroids. Yeah. What was the, the actual question? I, it's, well, this, my question is, how, do we have any energy in our orbit or in Mars orbit? Or? So, there are retrograde asteroids. Um, to create retrograde asteroids, it's that's complicated. How do you do that? How do you, how do, you do that? Anybody, any idea of dynamics? <laughs> well, you're, you're smart. <laughs> All right, so a mo I just heard that they must come from the Oort cloud. They might. Okay, they might come from the Oort cloud. So I guess what happens is you have something coming in from far away, it gets perturbed by Jupiter, and then it ends up on a retrograde orbit. Or it already has um, a uh, angular velocity. Or it, 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 yeah. yeah, it's already messed up when it comes in. <laughs> Is the LSST data going to, are you going to be able to say, like, find me this particular <laughs> asteroid in all of your photos, or are you going to have to, like... Good question. I think we didn't really talk about it. Yeah, okay, um, will, S will LSST uh, discover asteroids in, on its images? Yes, that's actually one of the reasons why it's being built. So, LSSD covers this huge patch on the sky, and it has pretty smart algorithms to find objects that are moving between images. So what it does is it takes, in, it takes a picture of the sky, one patch of the sky, 
the next one, next one, next one, next night it comes back and does the same patch on the sky again. Then what they do is they subtract last night's picture from this night's picture and they see things moving. So if you have something moving, it appears on two different positions on the image. All the stars go away, but you see the moving things and that uh, those positions get let out, and then they uh, have lots more algorithms to fit orbits to that, but that's a long story. So, but the, the answer is yes. Don't find those last ones. Let's hear it from